We're going to be looking at time, speed of light, and the age of the universe, and, and whether or not it contradicts Genesis 1. As we go through this, I ask you to uh, consider what Francis Bacon said many years ago. Read or listen not to contradict or refute, nor to believe or take for granted, but to weigh and consider. And I know that this is a controversial issue, and so I'm just asking you to consider both sides. Now, there is a difference between what scientists believe and what is a proven fact. A proven fact is uh, testable and repeatable. And what we hear a lot are assumptions and philosophy masquerade as a f masqueraded as a fact. In 2004, Anthony Flew, one of the world's most notorious atheists, changed his mind based upon the evidence of science and now believes that there is a God. He, in, uh, for 50 years, was uh, the world-famous atheist of the 1900s, author of over 35 books. Does God exist? Sorry to disappoint you, I'm still an atheist. In 2004, he said there was a God, and in 2008, he published this book by that same title. And he said, when you studied the interaction of two physical bodies, for instance, subatomic particles, you are engaged in science. If you ask how or why these particles could exist, you are engaged in philosophy. And he made this critical point. When scientists are engaged in philosophical analysis, neither their authority or expertise as scientists is of any relevance. And as you'll see as we go through, most of the differences in this debate are philosophical and they are not scientific facts. Now, the secular version of the origins of the universe, it represents the best philosophical analysis without a supernatural creator. It has the consensus of, of majority of scientists in the world. The National Academy of Science, however, you should be aware of, in a poll uh, in Nature uh, magazine, 93% are atheists or agnostic. So that is their worldview. And this philosophical version also has the authority of teaching in schools and universities. And uh, the underlying assumptions, though, of the origins are philosophical. And so, therefore, the consensus and expertise of these scientists is not relevant. And their secular version may not even be the best scientific explanation based upon all of the laws of science and things that we know in our universe. Now, this authority of teaching and consensus had an impact on our society for over 2,000 years. For example, Aristotle believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system. And it wasn't until uh, almost six, uh, 2,000 years later that that was finally overturned. He also believed back in 300 BC that the universe has always existed. It was eternal. And even as late as uh, 1930, most every cosmologist preferred an eternal universe as the beginning of time implied by Big, Big Bang imported religious concepts. In other words, if we stated that the universe actually had a beginning, it's a little bit too much like Genesis 1, no matter how the evidence may even be leading us. Even in 1980s, uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos series, he would often state the cosmos or the universe is all that ever was or ever will be. In other words, it was eternal. But it wasn't until the 1990s with the Hubble telescope, data from satellites, the Big Bang Theory, uh, all the science, scientists concluded that the universe had a beginning. And they also have determined that the universe is still expanding. Now, the expansion of the universe, to understand that, um, it's the stretching of space between the galaxies. It's not matter being um, uh, stretched. 
uh, it's not galaxies traveling through space, but it's the actual expansion of the fabric of space when they are talking about the expanding universe. So space, therefore, I know it's somewhat confusing, is an unseen structure and can be stretched as we see this model of the increasing scope of the universe. So the advocates of the Big Bang and the biblical creationists agree. Uh, both sides agree since the beginning, stars and galaxies have expanded away from Earth. But how did the stars get here? In other words, in the Big Bang, what caused the universe to go from this? And uh, there's a Latin phrase, since nothing comes from nothing, uh, the theory is there in the beginning there was never just nothing. Uh, the assumption was instead of an empty void, it had fleeting electromagnetic waves and particles that popped in and out of existence. And so this is what they believe has always existed from eternity. And from that, we get a mass that is formed and then the mass uh, expands and cause the Big Bang and we have the universe and planets and people. Now, if you go to the National Geographic website on the origin of the universe, scientists believe the entire vastness of the observable universe, including all the matter and radiation, was compressed into a hot, dense mass just a few millimeters across. So every molecule of um, matter was in that ball that eventually made all of the, the planets and people and stars. The Big Bang Theory leaves several major questions unanswered. So this is not scientific proof. One is the original cause of the Big Bang itself. Several answers have been proposed to address this fundamental question, but none has been proven. Not, um, and even testing them has proven to be a formidable challenge. Now, when the Big Bang expansion took place, different particles must be produced. Obviously, we must have an atom, proton, neutron, and electron. But there's also what's known as the particle zoo, and there's additional particles that have to be produced. Uh, for example, there's the photon that carries light energy, and there's a hypothetical uh, graviton, which carries the energy of gravity. Notice a lot of these have question marks because they're assumptions or they're hypothetical. Now, in addition to particles, in order for the Big Bang to work, we have to have established the four fundamental forces of nature because without these forces all the particles just float away. The first one is the strong force. It holds the nucleus of the atoms together. It is the strongest and the energy in this force is used in nuclear fission and atomic bombs. Next is the weak force and that's basically the decay of elements. Uh, they become unstable and without it the sun wouldn't exist or wouldn't work. The next uh, force uh, is the gravitational force and it's not only the force that binds the universe and the solar system together, it is also the force that is holding us into our seat. But what keeps us from being pulled through the atoms of our, of our chair? Well, that's the fourth force, the electromagnetic force that holds the atoms together. It holds the atoms of the chair that you're sitting on uh, together, keeping the atoms of your body from intruding into the chair's seat. Now, these laws of nature are not physical. They are non-physical forces that act on the physical. So here is the Big Bang. And uh, the Big Bang, when that pebble expanded, uh, is also the beginning of time. And we'll go into that a little bit uh, uh, further. But before um, the Big Bang occurred, there was no time. It was a timeless state because time is linked with matter. And, and don't worry about that. The model says that within the thousands of a second, the four forces of nature were created because if that didn't happen, those particles would just disappear, float away. 
Then within three minutes, protons, neutrons, and electrons were formed. And then within 380,000 to a billion years, the atoms formed, and then the stars formed and were compressed. And then galaxies, billions of years later, formed. And finally, this is today, 15 billion years later. Now, this Big Bang expansion is the philosophical explanation for the origin of the universe. And it basically assumes that force that is not physical, that existed outside of time because matter had not uh, been created, it predates the existence of the unif universe and this force created the universe from nothing. And this philosophical explanation of the origin of the universe, the Big, Big Bang, is very similar to Genesis 1, which was basically written 3,500 years earlier that stated God, who is not physical, exists outside of time. His existence predated the universe, and he created the universe from nothing. Now, the question is, how did the mass come from fleeting particles into existence. The first law of thermodynamics says energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can only be transformed. And then what made it expand? And the other question is, are new stars even being made? Now, uh, in 1995, this photo on the left was shown all over the media, NASA claiming this photo of this nebulae showing hundreds of stars were being born and forming. But seven years later, in Science News, infrared detectors saw inside these pillars and concluded there's too little dust and gas to support star formation. So the Big Bang must produce stars, and, the th and this theory of dust clouds collapsing to form stars has never been observed. And it requires gas to compress down to a critical mass to form a star. But when gas is compressed under Boyle's law, um, it causes pressure in the gas to increase, which causes it to expand, not to be compressed. And anyway, most stars are light years away from each other and far from gaseous nebulae in the galaxies and the universe. So the solution was uh, dark matter. And it's hypothetical, it's invisible, it's undetectable. And you'll f find this in the news today. In fact, has the missing 80% of the universe mass been found? The search for dark matter. And the reason why it's being promoted is it provides some type of strong gravitational energy needed to make stars. So it's hypothetical. In the Science Channel in November 2014, they told us as almost a, a scientific authoritative statement, when a star dies, it provides the raw materials to build new stars, solar systems, planets, and of course us. Every atom in your body came from the core of a star. Now, if you're not aware of this, you may not be aware that all of these were philosophical claims and not scientific facts. And the second law of thermodynamics say things don't go uh, from disorder to order. They go the opposite direction, to disorder, to less energy, to entropy. Now, the next question is, just how big is this expanding universe? Well, we have to understand what is a light year. And it's, it's, uh, it's really a distance, not time, uh, to express how far light travels in one year. And light travels roughly about 6 trillion miles a second. That's 180, I mean a year. That's 186,000 miles per second. And however, the distance to stars have already been calculated and expressed in light years. So just exactly how is that done? We'll talk about that, but I wanted to point out that light energy and photons always travel at the speed of light. And in addition, radio waves, your voice on a cell phone, also travel 
at the speed of light because they're part of that same uh, spectrum. Le electricity in a wire. Signals inside of your computer travel at the speed of light. Now, uh, time for the light to reach Earth uh, measure uh, is expressed in light years, and our sun only takes eight minutes for the light to reach us. The closest star takes 4.3 light years. The Pleiades takes 425 years for the light to get here. The farthest star, it's alleged, takes 13 billion years to get here. That's 78,000 quadrillion miles. And for the, here's the big conclusion. The assumption is for the farthest star's light to reach us, then uh, if it's 13 plus billion years old, then the universe must be at least that old. Well, before we answer that question, let's just kind of understand how many stars can we see with our naked eyes? We can see about 2,000 that are visible on a clear day uh, with 2020 vision. Uh, uh, there's about four to 5,000 stars you can see from every point on the Earth if you're in all the different hemis the hemispheres. It's interesting, though, how many stars were counted prior to the invention of the telescope, and they used stars and constellations for for uh, guidance back then. Uh, Ptolemy, a Greek astronomer, said there were a thousand stars to the naked eye. And uh, Brahe in 1598 said there were 965. But the Bible written 620 BC made many references in Jeremiah that the stars were as countless, um, uh, they were countless. It was a number that could not be counted. And we know that's true today. Now, how far away are the stars we see with our naked eyes? Well, here's the star chart, and on the left is the number of stars, and the horizontal is the distance away. And 70% of the stars that we see are only 500 uh, light years away from us. And 94% of them are less than 1,000 light years. So 94% of all the stars that we can see are about a thousand uh, light years away. It takes about a thousand years to get here. Now some of those stars are also might be distant galaxies or planets that that might look like a star. The stars that we see in clusters, uh, this is our Milky Way and the it's, it's alleged that the radius of the Milky Way is about 60,000 light years and the Earth is about uh, halfway uh, through the, the distance from the center. Now, how is this distance of the farthest star determined to be 13 billion light years away? Well, in early, uh, let's say, January, uh, there's a star A that we're going to look at, and they'll take an a angle measurement there. And then in early July, they'll look at that same distance there. And we know that uh, when the Earth travels on the other side of, of the sun in six months, there's roughly 186 million miles there because the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. And they create this um, uh, triangle, if you will, and use trigonometry. And for example, there's the Earth in early January, there's the Earth in early July, and there's the, the closest star. And they really use just the radius, and they compute this angle, and then they determine the distance, and that is the determination of, uh, of the distance, knowing uh, a side and, and angles. Now, here's uh, really what it uh, looks like here. And uh, because the stars move in, in six months, and so uh, they know this distance here, and, they, and that's a, a right angle, and that's uh, the distance to the, the star that's calculated. <clears throat> now, they show those triangles as somewhat, you know, not equilateral, but as a normal triangle. But if we were to take the base of that 93 million uh, miles, and if that was 4.25 inches just on a scale, how far would 
the other sides be? Well, the base would be four and a half inches, and the other side would be 20 miles, and that's to the closest star, which is 26 trillion miles away. Uh, that's a ratio of one to uh, 278,000. The farthest star would be four inches to 2.8 billion miles uh, on the side. Now, what are these angles going to be like? Well, we know that one is 90 degrees, so the other one's going to be uh, almost 90 degrees, but it can't be because then it'll, it'll go out into infinity. And this angle here, both of these are going to be incredibly small because that has to equal 90 degrees. And just to understand what we're talking about here, uh, one degree is uh, one thir 360th of a circle, an arc minute is 160th of a degree, an arc second is 160th of a minute, and the closest star is less than an arc second. So it's less than one uh, thirty-six hundredth of a degree. The farthest star is going to be a degree three billion times smaller than an arc second. And just uh, for terminology, a arc, uh, uh, micro arc second is a millionth of an arc second. Okay. Um, remember in Star Wars when Han Solo said, Han Solo said his uh, uh, falcon could do less than a 12 parsecs? Well, just understand this. A parsec is 3.3 light years. <clears throat> so... According to the science, space-based telescopes can get accuracy to uh, 0.001 arc seconds or 1,000 parsecs. So bottom line, our space-based telescopes can only uh, measure a distance based on the angles of 3,300 light years. And our best today was a new space observatory uh, that was launched and its maximum distance is 10,000 parsecs. So the most that we can determine something far away is 32,600 light years, if this is true. So these greater distances are assumptions, not mathematical calculations made about presumed size, intensities, redshift, nothing to do with distance. So that 32,000 uh, light years that we're actually able to get of the assumed 13 billion is only 0 0.00003 of 13 billion. It's just a small fraction of what the claim is. So in terms of the size of the universe, 13.5 billion years is an assumption. The true distance and the age is really unknown. It's large, but why is the secular world so adamant that the age of the universe is more than 13 billion years in the first place? Well, 13 billion years is necessary to support their philosophical assumptions to provide enough time for stars, Earth, and life to form. The Big Bang, if it happened 15 billion years ago, is necessary for then stars to form 15 uh, billion years ago or 5 billion years later and then another 5 billion years later for the, our sun and solar system to form earth 4.5 billion years ago and then our first oceans now if our universe has been expanding how much smaller was it in the beginning that's an important area as as we'll uh, be talking about and the other question is if the distance to stars and its age of the universe is based upon the speed of light, has the speed of light always been constant? Well, in uh, Discover Magazine, the 2002 issue, uh, the front cover, Actual Size of Universe at Beginning, and it states, uh, for light to get to the outer limits of the universe, according to Discover Magazine, it traveled faster than the speed of light. We've got this issue called the back, cosmic background radiation. It's the oldest light in the universe. And the observation is the temperature is uniform. It's the same everywhere in the outer reaches. Uh, 
It's called the horizon problem. And there's simply not been enough time, given 13 billion years, for the warmer radiation to travel to the cooler areas of the universe. Solution, a faster or variable speed of light. And uh, uh, the physics professor who's famous for this said a much faster speed of light in the infant universe solved this problem and therefore explained the overall smoothness in the background radiation. Okay, so we've got, is the speed of light always constant? Has time always been constant? Now, prior to the 1900s, the belief was time was constant. No matter where you were in the universe, time was the same. Today, we know that the rate of time is dependent upon an object's velocity, their speed, and also the strength of a gravitational field. Now, Einstein in his special relativity in the 1900s, it's basically a method of two people agreeing on what they see if one of them is moving. A simple illustration, uh, for example, if you're traveling in a car, let's say the back seat, and you toss up a tennis ball in your hand, to you, it looks like it goes straight up and straight down. However, to somebody who is stationary along the side of the freeway, if they watch you traveling by, they will see that that ball has traveled 88 feet. So an Einstein uh, conclusion was, and he proved, that if time is, time is different if one moves fast enough through space. Now, uh, the flow of time is kind of like a river flowing to, uh, towards the future, but we know now it can be slowed down or even speed, speed up. Let's say this is you uh, in the moment of time, and this is a stationary spaceship somewhere far away, and that slice horizontally through that river of time represents now. However, if that spaceship started moving fast enough, its angle through time uh, will cause time to be different based upon your, your position and also the spaceship. That's new, the now uh, uh, new representation of now. The second thing that Einstein came up with is <clears throat> in 1915, he predicted that uh, a gravitational time dilation. In other words, time would be slower in gravitational wells caused by the mass of an object. And this prediction was confirmed in 1959. So basically, let's say in this uh, situation, the sun in the fabric of space, space creates a gravity well. And uh, that uh, white ball represents Earth. And if we were to look at uh, a clock in outer space that's further away from us, we would see that that clock is running much faster. However, if we were out in space looking back at Earth, time would seem normal to us and we would see Earth's clock moving much slower. Uh, a good uh, uh, video on this through YouTube is uh, The Illusion of Time by uh, PBS. Now, also, another concept was, prior to the 1900s, the belief was space was void and empty. And today we know that space is like a stretchable, flexible thing, according to Harvard's answers to cosmic questions. The properties of space are still unknown, but as, it, as space stretches, it stretches time with it. Here's a science example of an elastic uh, kind of cloth, and if you put a mass with um, a gravitational, it'll create this type of well. And there are gravity wells where you can uh, throw marbles that go around and around, and the objects on the outer edges move much slower. Typically, they all roll into the middle because they're slowing down due to friction, but in space, there is no friction to slow them down. So here's the stretching of a fabric, and that's similar, that gravity well works the same as what Earth makes when the moon goes around uh, uh, the Earth in its orbit. And the gravitational well stretches time. 
So time is slower if the more you are at the center of that well, and time is faster the further you are away. And as an example, the space station is only 220 miles uh, above the Earth's surface, but it, its atomic clock uh, indicated that in each day it's 35 microseconds faster. Now that's a millionth of a second. Uh, however, the GPS satellites that are 12,500 miles above the Earth's surface, theirs are even faster at 45 microseconds each day, faster. And, uh, you know, another, this is kind of a thrown in, the astronauts aren't floating in space, but they're, they're, everything is falling due to the Earth's gravity and this gravitational well. So any orbit is a constant path of a free fall. And uh, the reason why the space station doesn't crash into Earth, because it, the gravity 220 miles is only above Earth is only 10% less gravity than, let's say, you, if you were in California. The reason is it's traveling at 17,000 miles per hour, and the Earth, Earth is uh, a circle, a, 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 a sphere, and the forward speed keeps it in orbit. And so the Earth makes a gravitational well not only for the space station, but also for the moon. And the uh, uh, space station is traveling 17,000 miles per hour and makes about 16 uh, orbits in 24 hours. The moon, however, is traveling much slower at 2,228 miles per hour, and it takes about 28 days uh, to make a full uh, orbit. Now, the sun creates an even bigger gravitational well, and all of these gravitational wells are moving because the Earth's moving, the sun's moving. Uh, uh, Mercury, for example, uh, the closest to the sun is traveling at 186,000 miles per hour, and then Earth is 67,000, and then as we get even further out, Jupiter is 29,000, and the furthest planet, Pluto, is traveling at uh, 10,000 miles per hour. So gravity, uh, gravitational wells, and the speed uh, affect time, and they b stretch and bend space as well. Now, a major question is, is our galaxy near the center of the universe? <clears throat> the Big Bang uh, model, which cannot be proven, uh, says, no, there is no center. The Big Bang was not, in essence, an explosion in space. In the beginning, all of space was filled with energy, and there's no center. There is no center to the expansion, and so Earth's position is not significant. It's only, after all, one of many meaningless specks. However, the creation view, which cannot be proven, is uh, uh, from the biblical. The Earth occupies the central position during creation. So the Earth, its galaxy, solar system is at or near the center of the universe. And the distant galaxies that we see are visible from all directions from the Earth. And galaxies are moving away from the Earth in evenly spaced groups. And the cosmic background radiation of the universe comes to the Earth uniformly from all directions. So there is some uh, uh, scientific observations that would back this up. Now one of the things to understand is whether you're Big Bang or creation, with Earth near the center, the fabric of space begins stretching outward. And so the galaxy's distance from Earth is increasing. And days on Earth, therefore, would be millions of years in the, fur in the furthest galaxies. And uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys, with a PhD in physics and um, many publications, uh, concludes that the universe may have been as much as 50 times smaller uh, at the moment of creation, and the gravitational time dilation would have occurred. And the, all the Genesis reference to time in the Bible is based upon time on Earth, not in the distant galaxies. 
Now, what is the probability that natural process, uh, processes alone could create a universe, planets, and even life? According to Paul Davies, an English physicist, we live in a world of astronomical unlikelihood. It's known as the anthropic principle, and it's a, it's a good term to Google and, and to read about. The universe, according to Scientific American, appears to be carefully designed for the well-being of mankind. And the author of the term anthropic principle said this, strange inequity of a universe that spends 15 billion years preparing itself for a creature, which is mankind, to evolve whose potential to survive is no more than a few million of years. Freeman Dyson, one of the world's greatest theoretical physicists, said, The more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, knew we were coming. A few examples out of hundreds and hundreds. Gravitational force. According to Lawrence Krass, if the gravi gravitational force were altered by point you look at, at that percent, astronomically small, neither Earth nor our Sun would exist, and you would not be here reading this. Stephen Hawking said, when the Big Bang you know, began, if the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, the universe would have recollapsed before it ever reached its present size. Now he goes on to say that this rate of expansion would automatically become very close to the necessary critical rate due to the density of the universe. In other words, since only things happen by natural process, of course it happened that way because we wouldn't be here uh, because there's no other alternative in their mind. Now another example is our sun's magnetic field protects in that kind of a bubble the entire solar system and even beyond from charged particles coming at us from deep space. So that's one of the uh, attributes, if you will, of the sun. And then the Earth's magnetic field protects us from the so sun's solar wind that would strip away our atmosphere and make life impossible. And Mars and Venus, for example, have no significant magnetic field, our, the planets closest to us. Our atmosphere, for example, just a few. Surface gravity strength prevents the atmosphere from r rapidly losing water to space. Our ozone layer filters out harmful ultraviolet radiation, and the atmospheric pressure enables our lungs to function and water to evaporate at an optimal rate to support life. So, given all of this and what we know about the universe today what did the bible say about creation and keep in mind genesis was written in 1450 bc well the bible speaks of three heavens the first heaven is our immediate atmosphere the second is outer space as far as it stretches or has been expanded and the third heaven is where god dwells given that let's just look at genesis 1 um, uh, verses 6 8 on day two let there be an expanse in the midst so that means in the middle of the waters and let it separate waters from the waters and God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse this is uh, uh, many people believe refer to our atmosphere there's the waters and it, our atmosphere and that's over the the oceans and verse 20 says that the birds fly in the expanse of heaven. That's the first heaven. Uh, this goes on to say, to separate the water under the expanse from the waters above the expanse. And that's interstellar space. And, and these waters, it goes on to say, God called the expanse heaven. And this would be the second heaven. Now on day three, uh, and God said, let the waters under the heavens, under the atmosphere, be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear, which was not the formation of the earth today, it was probably a large supercontinent. 
and then let earth sprout vegetation and plants. Now, on day four in Genesis 1, that's when the sun, moon, and stars were placed in the expanse. And this expanse is the interstellar space, and that was the fabric that, uh, that was stretched out. Now, Genesis 1-6 implies during creation there was a layer of water uh, created far away in space. Now, Earth is the only planet or moon that we know of that has liquid water, so this would exist in a, in a vapor or an ice if it was in, in space. The fact is, water is the most abundant compound in the universe. And the most common elements are hydrogen first, helium second, and oxygen third. So one of the reasons is uh, H2O is made up of uh, the top three elements found in the universe. Now, the uh, NASA had a publication in July of 2011 that Astronomers find the largest, most distant reservoir of water, probably in the form of ice or, or vapor. The water surround a quasar over 12 million light years. The water is equivalent to 140 trillion times all the water in the world's ocean. Water has been prevalent in the universe for nearly its entire existence. Now, in Genesis, uh, the expanse that's, that's used... Um, the Hebrew word uh, is rakia, and it means an expanse or something spread out, stretched out, made thinner. And there's over 17 verses from seven books in the Old Testament referring to the heavens stretching like a fabric. Job 9.8, for example, who alone stretches out the heavens? Or Isaiah 40, 22, referring to God who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Now, the Bible is somewhat, uh, is not somewhat, it is very unique considering it was written in 1450 B.C. and did not include uh, early pagan beliefs. In fact, many of the statements it made were verified or confirmed just hundreds of years ago. And um, example of that was it had a beginning. In other words, the universe was not eternal as originally thought. The sun and the moon were not gods but objects. Back in the pagan times, and especially Greek and Romans, they thought the sun and the moon were deities, were gods. Space, or heavens, has been stretched, which we now know is true. The number of stars cannot be counted. We know today that uh, with the invention of telescope, the stars are uh, uncountable. And finally, Genesis predicted uh, waters in space, and that has been confirmed. Now, to summarize and to conclude the differences between the creation and the uh, example in the Bible and the Big Bang expansion, expansion, Big Bang, size of universe was smaller billions of years ago. Bible, size of universe was smaller over thousands of years ago based on earth time stars and galaxies and the big bang formed after the expansion stars and galaxies in the biblical creation uh, formed before the expansion and then the fabric of space was stretched big bang no center to the universe bible the milky way or earth is at the center of the universe big bang Impossible for universe to be less than 13 billion years old due to distant starlight. Biblical model, with Earth at the center, time moved faster in space than on Earth. Big Bang, Earth is one of many meaningless specks in the universe. Bible, odds are astronomical that another planet has all of the right conditions for life. Big Bang, stars form first and its particles made planets, life, and people. Biblical model, Earth formed first, then stars, then people. Big Bang, the origin of life and mankind was a random accident from Big Bang debris. Biblical model, life and mankind were supernaturally created. The complexity of life boldly testifies to that observation. And finally, the, the secular assumptions for creation, 
they basically say, hey, you, uh, the speed of light has to be constant to get those uh, uh, long ages. Well, the secular often uses a faster rate to explain their scientific model, but the creationists don't really need the speed of light to be faster. Number two, time on Earth is the same as in deep space. Well, we know now uh, that velocity and gravity affect time, and if Earth was the center, light that takes billions of years to reach Earth, as measured by clocks in deep space, could reach Earth in only thousands of years measured by clocks on Earth. And third is the philosophical question of origins has to be limited and explain only by known natural processes. Well, the problem with that is the laws of nature and, and physics are how the universe is maintained and sustained, not how God created it. Creation was a supernatural event, and there are no godlike natural processes capable of producing the complexity of the universe, let alone life. Now, there are over 192 living scientists that publicly came forward with PhDs who believe in a young uh, universe, and many of them have degrees in astrophysics, astronomy, atmospheric physics, etc. Uh, Marcus Blitz is an example who uh, got his PhD focusing on distant galaxies 200 million light years away. What separates these scientists compared to the uh, Big Bang scientists is not so much science, but philosophy. And there are many other disputes and besides starlight and time in terms of the age of the universe, and these are, are just a few. And uh, in order to make to conclude this, uh, I can't go too much uh, in, into any of them. Uh, I will point out one, New Horizons swept by Pluto in July of 2015, and NASA reported that the age of Pluto was changed from 4.5 billion years to a mere 100 million years due to the lack of craters. And Pluto's out there with crowded, you know, crowded with other objects. Um, they used to think that Pluto was formed when Earth was formed. And the mountains on Pluto are still in the process of building and may be ge geologically active today. Now, here's the final thing. And that is, the question comes up, uh, Stephen Hawking. Well, if God created the universe, then who created God? And Bertrand Russell and um, Hawking, I mean, not Hawking, but Richard um, Dawkins said the same thing. Uh, first of all, there's what's known as the principle of causality. Everything that has a beginning had to have a sufficient cause. And the secular is, they believe that matter came into existence, but they don't know the cause. In answer to, then, who created God, God is not a created being. He is infinite. And this concept of infinite is outside, really, our comprehension. Time began with, with, with um, Einstein, time is linked to matter, and time began when the universe began. So in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. That's when time began. Time is linked to matter. Before creation, there's a timeless state, and it's not, it's not in chronological order. And God didn't have the time as we know it on his hand. All of our time is, 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 all of our life experiences are based in a chronological uh, time. It's not um, that the same way in a timeless state. And a person who exists before time was created, before the universe, can travel and be anywhere in our time, including the future. And an example of that was in Revelation chapter 4 when John was taken up in the spirit and he saw future segments of time that will occur in the future and was dumbfounded to try and explain it. But in, in last slide, none of any of this is important no matter what you believe. If you understand three important uh, truths, one is there is life after death. 
Second is you need to be saved from your sins. You're not good enough uh, to go to heaven uh, on your own. And the third is if you believe that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross paid the debt for your sins, and if you believe in him, it means you will not perish but have eternal life. I hope I have caused you to at least examine some of the assumptions that various models are based on and would encourage you to do your own independent study if you want to learn more. Thank you very much.